I'm going to, yeah. So I'm uh, reading from Revelation chapter 2, and uh, it's the first part of the, the chapter. So it's, it's the 29th of May 2022, and we're in the house of God, and we've come to look at his word. My text is verse 4, nevertheless, nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. And the title of my talk is Love Grown Cold. Uh, now the church at Ephesus was a <coughs> remarkable church. Indeed as you look at the way the, the Son of God speaks to them. I'm reading, let's say, the ver verse 3 verses. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, your labour, your and patience. How you cannot bear them which are evil. You've tried them which say they're apostles and are not, and you found them liars. And you've borne and had patience for my name's sake. You've laboured and have not fainted. You would think that's a pretty good commendation of a church that's serious about serving God. But then you get this terrible sort of sting, don't you? Be, I've got this against you. You've left your first love. Now that city at um, Ephesus, well, the city of Ephesus, uh, it was a remarkable place. It belonged, in a sense, to the goddess Diana. And I'd like to go to Acts 19 to look at that, because uh, this town was enthralled to a fallen angel. That's the truth of it. That's the truth of it. And we should never underestimate the power of those fallen beings, the, 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 the principalities in high places, the rulers of the wickedness of this world. You remember... Uh, how the how the Bible expresses it, uh, but in Acts nine, sorry, page one one o four and uh, one five six two in Acts Acts nineteen, and I'm looking at verse twenty six, where uh, there's been a a lot of trouble in in Ephesus because the the men of God have arrived. They've been preaching the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, great miracles, mass conversion. And uh, the tradesmen, because it's, it's like a, it's a, a place of spiritual pilgrimage. People go there to honour Diana, to go to her shrines, to buy images, and, and they, they were making a fortune. Um, there's some places like that in now, I'm thinking of Knock in Ireland. I mean, the, the money that's made on the different things that people go and buy there. Um, but reading in verse uh, 26... Because the, the tradesmen are very angry and they, they want to um, have the gospel stopped. It's causing them a, lot, a massive loss of business. Um, and they say this in verse 20. Moreover, you see and hear that not, a, not alone Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. This man is destroying everything that we believe in and by which we prosper. Well, isn't that a good thing? That the truth has arrived and the idol worship is being dealt with? And then in verse um, 27, so that not only is our craft in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. When they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and they cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You can tell that something was going on in the spiritual world, in the unseen world. And what happens next is, verse 34, uh, when they knew that he was Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. I mean, just try at home for two hours. <laughs> it's just, they were inspired. There's an evil presence being dislodged, and it doesn't like it. It's got the crowd busy. Imagine saying, crying, shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Even if for ten minutes should be worn out. Something is going on in the spiritual world. Definitely. Definitely. And 
Luke 11, please, page 1027 and 1453. And you see a principle here on verse um, 20. And they, they are, they're troubled that Christ is casting out demons. And they so hate him that they're saying he's doing it by the power of the devil. What a wicked thing to say. And verse 20, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come unto you because here heaven is reigning. These powers are being ejected. Their time is over. I've come with the power of God the kingdom of God has arrived in this situation. And we have to pray, aren't we? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In all kinds of circumstances and, and difficulties and oppositions and where we see Satan at work in our families, in our churches, in our nations, we are to pray that. And if, it wasn't the, if there was no point in praying it, would the Lord have instructed us to pray it? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would you send your authority as king to cast out these wicked things, to stop this rebellion against you? In this circumstance, I mean, the day will come when the whole earth will be under the authority of God, absolutely, as we know, uh, when Christ shall return to reign. And then he says this, when a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. They're all secure and comfortable. That's what was, that, what, what was happening at Ephesus. They were enjoying the massive trade, the, the, the tourists that came to worship Diana, the, the trinkets, probably very overpriced that they were buying. They were comfortable. They were enjoying it. Great. God knew something different. They, their comfortable souls are rushing to the lake of fire. They're going where Diana's going, where that fallen angel's going. And he's going to do something about it. And uh, see, when a stronger than he shall come and overcome him, he'll take from him his armour where he trusted and divided his spoils. And that's what happens at Ephesus. And I want to, I'm looking at the background because I want to, I think we need to look at the background so that we can understand what the Lord is saying to them in Revelation 2. That's why I'm going there. And I, to some extent, I would say, to a definite extent, all of us who have come to salvation in Christ have experienced what is spoken of here in Luke 11. Happy away from Christ, happy in our sins, maybe. Suddenly our world is shaken to pieces. I remember when I was saved as a very young man, early 20s, and I was in the legal profession, I was in Lincoln's Inn Field, standing on the corner, and I literally shook. I didn't know what was happening. I literally shook. God was doing something. And uh, all of that which I had been guilty of and bound by was going to be dealt with. And it, it comes like a tornado. And you suddenly... The realisation, I'm lost, I'm undone. I'm guilty of sin. I need this saviour. I need his blood. You know, that because a stronger man has arrived to release those goods that are imprisoned by that strong man, the prince of the power of the air, whatever you want to name him. Satan's power coming to an end. That's what was happening at Ephesus. Now, so much good can be said of... <coughs> that church and their, their works were getting better it seems and they, they were discerning, they could tell the difference between the people that said they were apostles and were not apostles and they said they're liars, they're that discernment and it seems like their labour for the Lord was getting more not less and they hadn't fainted they'd stood, withstood the, all the adversity that heaps upon every church but there's something awful, isn't there? You've left, left your first love. Now, if you go to Acts 20, and I, I just want to, I want us to look at the ministry which that church had had. Obviously, some decades before 
Revelation 2 is written, but it is this same church. I'm sorry, on page 1105 and 1564. And Paul, is, he's, he's never going to see them again in this life. He knows he's going up to Jerusalem and then on to Rome, and he's going to be martyred. And he's concerned about this church. He wants to really, I think, give the elders a real pep talk, actually, because he's not going to be there anymore. And so he reminds them of the, the kind of ministry that they've enjoyed. I'm reading in... Um, uh, verse 17 of uh, Acts 20, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, he called for the elders of the church. They come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humi humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, that was profitable unto you, but having showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the gospel summed up, isn't it? Repentance toward God and faith toward Christ. And then in verse 25, And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day, I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. When, when he makes that statement, it's an incredibly serious thing, you know. But he is saying, as their teacher, as their guide, that not one of them on that dreadful day will be able to say to him, my soul is lost because you didn't tell me. That's what it means pure from the blood of all men. And then he says uh, in verse 28, Now take heed therefore to yourselves, to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. I know this. This is shocking, isn't it? That after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves, it's amazing, isn't it? These elders, appointed by the Holy Spirit, under the direction of the best possible apostle, have still got that terrible disease. Which, oh, to me, I honestly find it shocking, alarming, that they have got that little bit of pride that's going to grow and they're going to want to have a following and a name. And they're going to say perverse things to get that. I mean, it's terrifying to me. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you, night and day, with tears. So one, well, why, I'm, why I'm here is this. What a background this church at Ephesus has got of guidance, of teaching. And obviously they've responded to that because they're going back to Revelation 2, page 1219. They are very competent in serving God up to a degree, and it's a high degree in many ways. And wolves have come in and they've said, Yeah, no, these aren't real apostles, they're liars. So they've had that discernment, thank God. And don't we need that? And don't we need it now more than ever, can I say? Um, and they seem to have stood and their works continued but something very, very serious has happened and it is their fault can I say that? it is their fault because God has given all of us everything we need for life and godliness we couldn't have a better shepherd, even if we don't have the Apostle Paul or anyone like him, perhaps, but we have, couldn't have a better shepherd. We couldn't have a better priest to whom we can go straight away, directly. We don't have to go through any human intermediary. Not going there now, but at the end of Hebrews 4, you get that, it, that's emphasised so powerfully, isn't it? Don't know why can we say it's their fault? I'll tell you why, because 
In verse 5, the direction given to them is this. You've got to do two things. Remember and repent. He might almost have said, and I'm kind of adding a little bit, but he might almost have said, look, forget all your works and your discernment and your patience. There's something far more important that you've got to think about and remember when you really loved me, when you first met with me, when I was so real, so thrilling, that that relationship was so marvellous to you, it was everything to you, remember that and repent. And repentance always <laughs> indicates it is our fault. Repentance can never be effective unless there is a total, genuine acknowledgement, I am to blame. I am to blame. I have no excuses. There might be a thousand reasons why, but none of them is an excuse. Because whatever was heaped upon me, that was brought against me, that was defective in others, if I'd stayed true to God, he would have made a way for me. Always. So I've got no excuse. And, there, and, and we've got to have that. If, we, if repentance is ever going to be any use. And, and it's so serious because he says, if you don't do that, I'm in verse 5 still, I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of his place. If that love isn't there, isn't restored, the Lord isn't going to let that church be a shining light anymore. They may still be giving out truth, doctrine and everything, but the Spirit of Christ won't be there if they don't love him as they should. That to me is a very serious issue, to me anyway. As well as that meeting with the elders, we could go to his letter to Ephesus. As I'm in Ephesians, obviously, page 116, Ephesians 2, 1163, and uh, 1645. Paul, did, he, Paul writes to them, obviously, it's some years before the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus, is speaking to them in the book of Revelation. But the, the things, that, I want to read some of this, because Ephesians 2, you as he quickened, brought to life, you were dead in trespasses and sins, you Ephesians, Wherein in time past you walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You were part of that strong man's goods. But somebody stronger came. You were dead, but you were given life. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Thank God for that gift. And can I just say this very um, emphatically, that gift is for anybody. If you want believing faith, ask Jesus Christ and he'll give it to you. Without any doubt. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Uh, so you may think, well, I haven't got the faith some of these in here have got. Look, I could say that myself. God will give us that faith without any doubt. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, John. I'm reading from verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the, oh, it runs right through the Bible, but it runs so much through... Paul's epistles, that, that prayer is so, so important. And nothing could be more important, really. That's how God has ordained things. We seek him in prayer. And he knew that he wants to convey to that church the majesty of what Christ has given them. 
And, and it's, unless God gives you that revelation, it's just words, isn't it? Unless the Spirit of God makes it something that grips you and uh, enlightens you inside, well, you might know it to be so and believe it to be so, but it just doesn't do anything really. So he's saying, I am praying to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. I have to say this, I've asked God for that so many times, and I thank God for the measure of that which he's done in my soul, you know, that, uh, that because there's a need for something that I do not have. And I need the Spirit of God to strengthen me within and that's what he does. Strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. May but comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. And to know the love of Christ. Which passes knowledge. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I am on my knees. So God will show you what he's done for you. What is there for you? Now to him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Isn't that an extraordinary statement, isn't it? But we can ask and think of some pretty spectacular things, can't we? But God can do more than we're capable of even thinking about. So what, doesn't that verse say that? To him, by, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. You Ephesians... You Christians, all of us, you have everything. Everything. So then how could your love grow cold? That's why it's, and that's why it's so serious. And he's told them what they've got to do. You've got to remember, go back, and, and it's something that we have to do, don't we? I think it's something we have to do at many levels and for many reasons, you know, to go... To go back into the past to sit, to remember what God has done to rejoice in that to build on that, to thank him for it and to know with an absolute certainty if he did that then he can do it now he was, that, he was good enough to me then why would he not be the same now God doesn't change does he and it's never to do with what I deserve. If that was the case, I would, be, I would have no hope. It's never to do with that. It's what his son has paid for. At a price we will never know. I remember last night when I was um, wanting, you know, as I frequently do, that something more, something renewed, something a bit like this, I guess, and... And I, and I do thank God, I really do, that. And I, and I get it mainly from James, you know, James 1, if any man lack wisdom, ask, and God gives to all men liberally and doesn't tick us off, he actually is so generous to give us another opportunity of hearing from him. And I thank God pretty much every single time when I do that, I get an answer pretty much straight away. And, and it just the, the answer last night was just this, just come to me, come to me. I've forgotten the greatness of what you did those years ago, maybe. My love isn't what it was. All right, well, come to me. Come to me. The answer to everything is to come to Jesus, isn't it? And I can remember talking about loving the Lord. Uh, I was preached some years ago now. Um, we had a great man of God we knew called Bob Cox. He was a marvellous man of God. He's gone to heaven now, but... Um, and lived quite a long life. I was preaching uh, in a place in Wales called Cross Keys, and he was in the audience, he was in the congregation, and it was a time of worship, and somebody struck up a song, I don't know if you know it, um, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim, in the light of his glory and grace. And when we'd sung that, Bob prayed. And I, I, it, it, I will never forget it. 
because it spoke of an, an intimacy, a love. He said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I'm never able to take my eyes away from Jesus. All the time, I'm looking at him with love, adoration, gratitude, joy. And that's what, this is what he's talking about. And I, I, this is the most important thing of all. In many ways, it is, it is everything. Um, you know, you get to 1 Corinthians 13, the great chapter on love, and it, the alarming start of that chapter, you can move mountains with your faith, you speak your tongues like an angel, understand all mystery, but without love, it's all nothing. And I thank God for what Christ has done for me, and I know you do. But that love for him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. I can't take my eyes off Jesus. And that really, really went home. Because it be, the, the thing about that occasion when Bob said that, it was the, well, the spontaneity, <clears throat> the reaction to a song telling us to turn our eyes upon the Lord, but it was the sincerity. You knew this man adored Christ. He adored Christ. And, and that's, the, it, that's the most important thing, isn't it? Well, the two great commandments. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. And the second is like it. And I would not, I'm, and, I, and I fear this, and, I, and it's, I've seen it often enough and I see it here in the word of God, I would not wish to have a life of successful service where I've grown cold, where I've grown distant from my Saviour. And if there's any sign of that, then I'm going to do what this, this says here. And he's, he's telling you, great what you do, getting better than ever. Your works, your patience, your discernment, you're bearing the heat of the day. But I've got this to tell you. You've left your first love. So remember and repent. And thank God he's always there waiting for us, isn't he? So everything can be put right. And that love can be rekindled into a greater flame than it's ever been. I believe that for myself. I believe that for this church.